That goes where I move on to the second part of my argument. This is the optimistic view of a possible future. Um, Lancaster University has just taken over something called the Work Foundation, used to be the Industrial Society, posh offices in London, <coughs> and, and Will Hutton's written a number of books, like the one was called The State We're In. Um, so I call this uh, kind of an opt optimistic view of our state. So the state has at least a double meaning, the term. One means the institution of the state, and one, the other is the state as in the condition we're in. And it's probably in, in both senses. Um, there's a kind of progression in things. We've talked about the Industrial Revolution, the era of management. Um, before that, we've had the agricultural era. And before that, we've had the hunter-gatherer era. Um, and you know, <coughs> you can, and, and I'm arguing with, now we're allegedly into the knowledge economy. <coughs> so I, <coughs> the, the kind of noughts get, so we were, in the, we were hunter-gatherers for millions of years, in the agricultural mode for thousands of years, in the industrialized era for a few hundred years, um, and possibly in the knowledge economy for a few tens of years. <coughs> I won't take too long, but if you take, I mean, farming is still there, agriculture is still there quite obviously, but with the exception of organic farming, which is there, but not vast, um, farming's been industrialized. So they said that the only difference between a farm and a factory is in the factory, the goods go through the machines, and on the farm, the machines go over the goods. The plough, you know, the seeder, the fertilized spreader, the insecticide spreader, and, and the harvester. So it's, a, it's an outdoor factory, in other words. and. Um, in terms of uh, the knowledge economy, that's the next step on. <coughs> um, the the um, insecticide spray may well on the track behind the tractor may be well be controlled by a satellite uh, beaming stuff back to the Monsanto head office as a supplier of it. So that's that's a, so these things still exist, but they kind of get colonised by the by the next um, <coughs> next move on. <coughs> and the last one, which I, I call Spiral culture, when I feel brave enough to mention the spirituality word, and, or identity culture if I don't. <clears throat> but in either case, it's about meaningfulness. Um, so what we're selling is meaningfulness. So for example, you're not, I wouldn't expect you to be uh, kind of um, branded um, t-shirt wearers. So you just about got one, what's your t-shirt? You gentleman with a bluish t-shirt, what's the little logo? It's a growing club. George. What's your t-shirt say? George. It says clothing crew company. Clothing crew company. <laughs> so he must be the, the youngest in spirit person here. <laughs> but the, the kids you see with their baseball caps back to front and the Nike t-shirts and trainers and all that stuff. Okay. Well, the Nike t-shirt may cost 50 pounds minimum. It'll cost 50p to make it in China. One pound 50 to ship it over here probably a pound to sell it to you. Yeah? So it's um, what you're, you're paying like 46, 47 pounds for the image, for the brand. I mean, you, if you're hard up, you can get one at um, Primark for, for three quid, can't you? So what are people paying for? They're paying for an image, aren't they, an identity. And it said, you know, the shopping mall. Do you, what's, uh, what's that one down in Manchester, Trafford Park? Trafford Centre. Trafford Centre, yeah, you know that one? Yeah. yeah which is a typical Manchester mega kitsch, isn't it? Mm. Um, uh, and people say they're the cathedrals of the 21st century. We used to go to church. We don't go to those shopping centres just to get the basics of food and clothing. We do it to look for a kind of new meaningfulness. It's a social activity. Um, we're looking for new identities. Am I going to be a Nike person, Adidas person? You know, it's like saying, am I going to be a Christian or a Muslim or a... Methodist or, or whatever. And funnily enough, the Trafford Centre does have a vaguely Muslim look about mm -hmm. it, I think. Oh, that's interesting. I hadn't thought of that, but you're right. So Especially trying at to, night. It's trying to play to the multicultural society. Yeah, yeah. cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting. I, I, I've only been once. Yeah, <laughs> you've got to go once. It's a complete hellhole. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I've never been back. Yeah, yeah my wife would agree with you. Yeah. And the same company are trying to do the same thing on the Liverpool waterfront yeah. at Birkenhead. Yeah. They think yeah. that is the answer to Birkenhead's problem. <laughs> well, Another traffic centre. Okay. <laughs> oh, it, it, it has caused hell, that traffic centre. Yeah, so that sort of applies a bit like I said earlier, as customers, employees. And what, what's one of the interesting things about meaningfulness 
as well as for customers, the buyers of Nike T-shirt. Um, organisations are increasingly concerned with kind of well-being and happiness, and um, what uh, what employees get marketing. I know some some organisations. Um, so the BBC is the second most popular place for graduates after after, the, after the universities. <coughs> Whereas probably um, BA systems. Anybody work for them in their sordid past? No. Um, it probably isn't because at the end of the day they make weapons of mass and minor destruction. And in fact, I was on the train back from London sometime last year, and there was a bloke who had a few beers, and I'm sure he was going to war. And he said. I'll be able to tell my grandchildren I made the fuses for the bombs on both sides of the Iraq war. <laughs> cool, eh? <laughs> so not the most meaningful thing to do, obviously. <coughs> um, so it, it works in that way. <coughs> it's enemies that unite us, and it used to be, you know, the Cold War, <coughs> USA, USA and Russia, all the Western Russia, uh, the Berlin, Berlin Wall came down, what, 20 years ago? I can't remember. And then, I think... This week? Yeah, sorry? It's the anniversary of this week. Is it? it? Right. 30, 20 years? Probably about that. 20, 20, 20, 20, yeah. 20, yeah, that sounds about right, doesn't it? Um, and it seems to me, kind of, you need an enemy. And there seem to be two, two candidates. One is Al-Qaeda and the extreme fundamentalist Muslims, um, which at first I didn't think existed, but clearly they do, or perhaps they've been brought into existence by the belief in them. And the other is the eco stuff, the environment. And I think it'd be better for the world if we at least give quite a lot of priority to the um, to the to the second of those. But um, in terms of how things go, I believe in a mixture of some Darwin you've heard of, evolution, survival of the fittest, uh, random variation, um, reproduction, and selection. Fine. And there's a, a couple of people called Maturana and Valera that talk about a word called autopiesis, which I can never spell. And that's the other way around. They say um, systems don't adapt to the environment, they adapt to environment in our interest. So um, a chap called Peter Binder, a philosopher at Warwick University, said, an amoeba faced with a shortage of water shrivels up into a little lump of jelly, sits there, and if the water camp comes back in time, they can rehydrate into a happy little amoeba. And if it doesn't, they're literally dust. Um, whereas what do human beings do faced with a shortage of water? Nick somebody else's. Nick somebody else's, true, yeah, yeah. Any other answers? We ration it. Yeah, that, I mean, well, is that, yeah, so we adapt the environment, we, we dig wells, we build dams, we build pipes, and uh, uh, goodness knows what. Another not so good answer is we... You'd have to regulate the apportionment of this resource as well. Yeah, so we've got water meters coming in instead of... Method. Yeah. Uh, we got to apply violence against the individual that transgresses. Yeah. Seriously, yeah. If, if, if you're down to water shortage, yeah. this is the stuff of life and death. For sure. And you would have to regulate it, its distribution. Yeah. And you would have to um, support that regulation by extreme force where necessary. And, uh, there's a, a, a chap called Gregory Bateson, who you may not have heard of, who says as well as all that, there's an, it, it pays us to be part of larger units of survival. So rather than be a, an individual, you're better off as part of a family, and the family is better off as part of a tribe, and so on and so forth. And I think that makes sense. Um, and many organisations are made up of tribal groups. Uh, <coughs> um, uh, but the thing about that is that the, 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 as you get to bigger and bigger units of survival, it gets progressively more dangerous. And ultimately, you could have you could have the kind of liberal democratic question mark Christian uh, West versus the uh, fundamentalist Muslim East or something like that. Or you know, back in the in the Cold War, we had. Do you remember Doctor Strange Love, the film? Yeah. Um, and it still seemed to me to be a main, 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 minor or major miracle that we didn't have the nuclear holocaust. Um, I mean, I, I went on the second and third Aldermaston marches. We got multiple places with nuclear capability. There's more and more chance that one of those will fall out with, uh, with somebody and, and trigger the whole uh, thing again. So it's, um, we shouldn't turn our back on that one, in my view. Yeah, so as I mentioned, um, 
he, uh, earlier, I, I think he's right, not in the sense of this, as I said earlier, it's a hardwired truth, but there's a strong cultural belief, um, particularly in Americans, that you can't self-actualize without having a full stomach and reasonable certainty that it will stay that way. Whereas, as I said, the Zen, Zen Buddhist monk seems to be able to do it. <clears throat> so the more that we can go that way uh, in our economic activity, I think the better chance we've got. And as I briefly mentioned earlier, <clears throat> many of the developing countries, it's the BRIC countries, uh, Brazil, Russia, India, and China. Interesting, isn't it? Um, well, so India and China will m most obviously have their spiritual roots. Um, for a long time in the USSR, I guess they were pretty strongly repressed. But I guess in that case, it does show that they are the plants down to the ground and can sprout out again, because the church, churches of all forms were repressed in the USSR, weren't they? But I guess they've blossomed since, and I'm not sure about Brazil. Brazil was, Brazil, was it a Portuguese colony? Uh, it's amazing. Spanish. Catholic, Catholic. Catholic, Catholic, yeah, I'm sure that's right. Yeah. With uh, a lot of liberation theology. Of course, of course, yeah. Um, that lot, yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, very interesting. Uh, I went to a, a, a seminar at London Business School last year by a group of people called evolutionary psychologists who believe that our, our psych psychological makeup was largely shaped by those millions of years on the uh, plains of Africa. Um, a, a number of things. So, for example, in terms of leadership, uh, their proposition is that the will to lead is largely innate, but the ability to do it well can be learned. And American Airlines has a slogan which is recruit for attitude, train for skill, which is more or less the same thought. Um, and there's even some physiology supporting this. So the amygdala, the bit on the top of your spine, where the, uh, where the nerve signals from your senses, eyes, ears, touch, etc., go first, is the emotional part, <coughs> and the outer cortex uh, is the cognitive thinking part, and they've evolved in that order. <coughs> I don't you agree, but many people observe, when you, when you first meet somebody, you kind of make, make your mind up about them, you have an emotional reaction, they look nice, they look not so nice. And they say in, in job employment interviews, people more or less make up their minds in the first five minutes, or quicker, and spend the rest of the time with their psychometrics and interviews, and simulations and goodness knows what, um, justifying the conclusion that they came to in the first place. Um, I don't really buy that, but it makes a lot of sense to me. Um, but the, the one that I want to draw attention to here is there was somebody from marketing, and the marketing people with this approach believe there are four or five basic human urges that all marketing uh, sells to. Um, uh, one's going to be sex, isn't it? <laughs> but, um, um, <clears throat> well, there's one that's called conspicuous consumption. Um, uh, <clears throat> sorry, conspicuous greed. We, we'd know it as conspicuous consumption. That is, you have stuff, not because you need it, but because it makes you look rich and prosperous and successful and all that. So, a big flashy car when a Nissan Micra would do materially for your, for your needs and so on and so forth. And I guess the, you know, the Trafford Centre would qualify as a building. Uh, but the point is that if, if India and China and all the other developing countries take off largely on conspicuous consumption, environmental, we're absolutely done for. Yeah. <clears throat> because if, if every Chinese family has a fridge and a car like we have in the West, the, particularly for the old kind of fridges with whatever it was. CFC. 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 Yeah, when they get smashed up, ditto the cars. Um, and so I find it hard to believe. I said there's already enough tarmac on the roads in China to cover the UK ten times over. Oh yeah. So that, a new role for leadership would be um, what can leadership do? So I'm not doing away with leadership, but saying this I might define the new direction that it um, might usefully go in. My argument is a largely optimistic one: is that the knowledge economy is barely, is barely getting underway to varying degrees in a very context, but we're open to another condition or state, uh, that's identity culture, and we talked about all that. But the point is, if we can move on from the material manufacturing thing to uh, knowledge economy and, uh, and stuff, so, you know, the laptop costs, what, 600 pounds, it's probably only got 20 pounds worth of silicon and stuff in it. The, the rest of the value is in knowledge, so that if we have knowledge product, well, products with knowledge content, 
and products and services with knowledge content and meaningfulness um, content without too much of a cost. And I think you know, we can have, in that sense, development and expanding economy. Having said that, um, it said that it's hard to, you know, what's a knowledge worker? You define it in one way, everybody is one. Define it another way, almost nobody is. <laughs> but a kind of middle ground thing, which is people largely work with their heads rather than their hands. In America, <coughs> which would expect to be at the forefront of this, only 20% of the, of the uh, working population are knowledge workers. The rest are still sw sweeping hotel lobbies and um, flipping McDonald's hamburgers or bolting wheels on cars or stuff like that. But it's still there and it, and it is the edge. Um, and developmentally, some, some countries uh, are following the progression like India or like China and parts of India. In other places like Singapore, it's trying to jump over it and get into the high value added stuff from the start and not do the mass production. <coughs> Chinese sort of stuff, and there's an uh, education economist in the management school who went, went to India, and he said, yeah, I visited on factories in cotton, or just like reading Charles Dickens in terms of what's going on, so that's the, the slow route. But, you know, you know there are some, some parts of the world where there's no point in laying copper cable-based telephone systems. You go straight for mobile phones and satellites and areas, because it's just better, easier, and cheaper, and all the rest of it. So that's, that's what jumping over uh, stage of development looks like. Um, uh, yeah, so whether, whether we go for um, a, a, a highly material, as in conspicuous greed or consumption, or some other thing, seems to make a, a vast difference uh, to what we can do. Yeah, so we can walk into it. Uh, Charles Carter, the founding vice chancellor of this university, was a Quaker economist, wrote a little penguin book called Wealth. And he was trying to kind of save the term wealth for well-being um, in all senses, um, spiritual, medical, whatever, as opposed to wealth meaning, uh, you know, the Harry Enfield character, loads of dosh, you know. Um, <coughs> so in some sense, it, so part of this would re, um, rediscover. Is this, is this recent? What, Charles Carter? Yeah. No, um, he died in 1982. As I'm just wondering that uh, I think Ruskin beat him, didn't he? Because Ruskin had the idea of wealth, an ilf, which showed mm -hmm. what he thought wealth. That's had. a good one. He yeah. almost certainly did, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I imagine Carter wrote this probably in the 50s or yeah, something yeah. like that, whereas Ruskin yeah. could be king of Rome. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't think Carter would have necessarily claimed it was original thought, though still probably. Yeah, but I think ilf is a good one. Ilf, yeah, yeah. yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah, so that's all part of the. Um, mm -hmm. Part of the same thing. Yeah, very good. All this. I mean, a lot of people still don't want a decent wage, but they want good conditions as well. And interesting in this country, um, uh, I started my career back in 1966 <coughs> with the evaluation of um, a leisure development project at, uh, at um, SO Forley, the um, oil refinery on the outskirts of Southampton Water. And, and the reason they were having a leadership development program was that Exxon had done a worldwide survey and found it was the lowest labour productivity um, <coughs> a oil refinery had anywhere in the world. Um, <coughs> the management rather than do anything about it, so we'll do some management training. <laughs> um, and loads of interesting stories there. <coughs> I'll ask me later. Um, <coughs> and between 19, 2000 and 2002, I was seconded to another inquiry into management and leadership pretentiously called Council for Excellent Management Leadership. <coughs> and um, the kind of, and that was sponsored by the uh, Department for Education and Department for Trade as it was then. <coughs> but the um, number 11 Downing Street interest was, was low labour productivity. <coughs> it hadn't really changed, you know, like women in senior management haven't changed proportionally in uh, 50 odd years. <coughs> um, and uh, and I think the reason is deeply cultural, which is that we'd rather go to work, spend longer, spend more time socialising with our colleagues at work, rather than do a quick job, be productive, go home and live our social lives outside the workplace. I think it's a deeply embedded, for the UK at least, cultural thing. <coughs> which may be better from this, this point of view, uh, or uh, it's not worse. Uh, interesting that the parties have turned out to be much more interested in the soft side, the management, the leadership of the management change. <clears> than <throat> the science of um, 
the ego, which is very contested. I mean, there's no contest that uh, climate change is happening, but whether that's a result of human agency is a bit less clear. Whether we're beyond a tipping point, and we're in trouble if we you know that's a point of no return. We're in trouble. All is that. I think even if you try hard, it's difficult to get a kind of reliable scientific answer to it in the classical sense of the word scientific. There are now more Rolls Royce cars sold in China than uh, anywhere else, keeping them going. Rolls Royce. That is the biggest uh, traffic jam ever, and it's not Los Angeles. It is actually in China. And it's seven or eight lanes wide, and it's like probably 15 or 25 miles long. Um, yeah, so they haven't got enough tarmac to cover us 10 times over. Yeah. yeah, and that's obviously, if it keeps on like that, then we are done for, aren't we? We are at a kind of tipping point in another sense. If we go the material route, we could well be done for. Uh, <coughs> um, yeah, I mean, if, if we do, and, it, and if the tipping point argument isn't true, then maybe we'll, as it begins to hurt, because people don't really respond until they actually feel the pain, do they? Uh, the question is, by the time you feel the pain, the damage may be irreversible, so that's a big issue, isn't it? And it may or may not be, and it's hard to tell. Uh, and people talk about the precautionary principle, which is that we should proceed as though it is true, which in general sounds like a good idea. But it's not perfect, because we could waste a lot of resources uh, on things that aren't necessary. So. That doesn't actually, well, 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 I think it's probably a good idea in moderation. It doesn't solve everything. Um, so is there a new role for leadership and leadership development in all that? So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Mm -hmm. right. um, and I've got a theory about performance management, that um, the more you're asking people to do things that they don't want to do, the more you need performance management. The kind of extreme case of that for me is British Aerospace Systems. I hope I'm not getting into trouble, but um, um, and BA Systems has a GE-based um, performance management system which includes rating people and what uh, what's his name called picking low-hanging fruit, firing the people in the bottom five or ten percent. And BA Systems were trying to do that at least for their top leaders and managers, um, whereas the BBC has minimalist performance management and the systems they do have are largely honoured in the breach and by neglect, but they invest a fortune in, in development. So if people are going to do what, what the organisation wants them to, then you have to develop them to do it better. <coughs> but if, if you want to do something else, so it's probably more fulfilling to work for that kind of organisation. <coughs> performance management systems have come in much more in the academic world in universities in the last decade or two um, and probably we've, we've, we're doing less you know, more mass teaching of a kind that we don't ideally like to do I mean I was an undergraduate in the 60s I was one of a class of 30 now our classes of undergraduates are typically be 200 or something like that certainly more than any, any lecturer could ever know <coughs> and there's much more marking and, and so on and so forth <coughs> we all know about the kind of performance management of research output, don't we? <laughs> um, so it's coming in, in for us, and some people uh, say they do their best work in retirement when they're beyond all that kind of stuff, which is interesting. I mean, David's man, man enough to walk back into the lion's den, having escaped yeah. it several times. Yeah. <laughs> How do you punish a mathematist? <laughs> And uh, so that, I mean, going back to the earlier part of what you said, I think um, one of the things that's coming in through the doors, whether we like it or not, is students will use Wikipedia, won't they? Yeah, yeah. and we, we can't ban it. Um, <coughs> uh, I myself go to Google and Google Scholar, and then I go to something at Lancaster called One Start that does all those wonderful things, and technically it's brilliant. Um, <coughs> and Wikipedia occasionally. Um, so I think at least we can well, we recognize the futility of resisting that uh, and in, embrace it and open it. And you have your info center downstairs, which is open to the public, haven't it? And we've got our learning <laughs> zone at Lancaster. I think um, a bit like uh, office blocks in central London. You know, they're not for things for people to work in. They were invited in. They're, 
that kind of meeting places. So university campuses probably become fairly um, porous. Um, some boundaries will not be necessary. Meeting places where ideas, knowledge can be generated and shared. And I think that's probably the, the campus of the future. Well, I, I, think, I think you need both and, and the balance. And I think one of the reasons why to, total, quality man, total quality management is one of the great survivors as a change recipe is it, it does have both. It has the statistical process control on the one hand and the Kaizen quality circles on the other. So I think it's quite brilliant in balancing the two. So scientific leadership would be a, a good bet for the future, I think. Yeah. Yeah, some people are talking about a process 